on this topic. Um, and so here we are today. Uh, the activity and adventure and sports tourism side of things is clearly something which has been growing enormously over recent years. Um, and uh, there have been other sessions here talking about the responsible tourism side of this kind of tourism. Um, this session is about the growth of this kind of tourism. And um, as we all know, if we've been coming to this event for a number of years, we used to go to an event where most of the <coughs> operators working there would be um, simply promoting places for people to go on holiday. And there was a time when that's what they wanted to do. And if they did an activity or went on an adventure, it was on Tuesday afternoon and it cost them $25 and it took one hour. Well, totally different world nowadays. Your stellar team of um, speakers this afternoon is, uh, first of all, Chris Doyle, who is the Executive Director Europe for ATA. Um, do we have many ATA members in the room? There you are, Chris, have a look around. Hello. And then an awful lot who aren't ATA members. Um, I first came across ATA as somebody who is a generalist in tourism by seeing the write-ups that they had for their uh, conferences, uh, which were saying just how <coughs> vibrant and useful they were. And we all know conferences can be really good or really awful. Well, that's what attracted me first to the fact that, that they know all about this. Um, Chris is going to lead off with some of the most recent facts and the way things are pointing for the future of adventure travel. And he's prepared to do that without his initial visuals, which um, meanwhile the plumbing will go on down here. Hopefully by the time that we get um, to the end of Chris's um, uh, session, although before that if possible, but if not Chris, then if you wouldn't mind talking for an hour, we'll probably be all right by then. Um, second, we have Paul Easto, who is the CEO of Wilderness Scotland. He started uh, Wilderness Scotland, and of course it's been a great um, product for them in Scotland. Uh, the, the nature of the land, the character of the people, the type of tourists who choose to go there. Then Catherine Crone, who is Managing Director of Headwater Holidays, 27 years in the business. Um, not necessarily Catherine in that role, but... Um, the company, 27 years of development and change, as I said to her earlier today, although this is true both of, um, of uh, Headwater and of Explore, um, my, my wife and her friend's first experience of going, shall we say, on something which was not a standard holiday, but something which moved them into the world of adventure and activity, was indeed with um, Headwater Holidays. Uh, then Ashley Toft, Managing Director of Explore, a vast portfolio of different things to do. Um, and I'm pleased to say I've experienced all three of those products. Um, Chris represents so much that I can't say I've experienced that, but no doubt um, I've done that too. So Chris, thank you for rescuing us in this interregnum. And um, please come and tell us what you were going to say with beautiful pictures, but now do with beautiful facts. Welcome Chris Doyle, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Can you hear me in the back? tend to not like to do the lectern thing, and I want to make sure since we're videotaping, we're still in scope. Are we? I don't think you are unless you're closer to the microphone. Yeah. All right. So I'm forced to stand uh, behind here. I'm going to use a cheat sheet here, which is my PowerPoint. I don't tend to do those. Adventure tour tourism is far too exciting for that. Earlier today, some of you had attended the 11 o'clock session. How many people here uh, from that? My apologies, there will be a slight overlap, but not a lot, okay? I do have to define adventure tourism for the rest of the audience here, so we're all starting in the, uh, on the same page. First off, uh, I am executive director for ATTA in Europe. I've been with the organization since we took it over in 2004, shut it down for a year, looked to the industry, got feedback on what the industry truly wanted on a global scale, not just a North America scale. And as it turns out, here we are uh, in 2012. We've got about 850 organizational corporate members worldwide. They include uh, tour operators, destination tourism boards, uh, accommodations, agents, an incredible pull of journalists from around the world, uh, and media outlets themselves, which are organizational members. Uh, and so we look at the entire supply chain. Our mission is develop strategically uh, responsible tourism uh, around the globe. As a point of clarity, the title also of this session talks about 
sports tourism. And I'm, and as I understand that, that's more of uh, the Olympics type things and World Cups. What I talk about will not address that. So let's define adventure tourism. In Europe here, we do talk a lot about activity tourism. Uh, and throughout the world, there's all sorts of subsets of adventure tourism. It could be ecotourism. It could, it could be activity-based tourism, culinary mixed with cultural tourism, agritourism, all these different topics. And what we do and what we've done, and this is based on the industry, this is not the ATTA arbitrarily saying, here's the definition of adventure travel. But adventure travel does incorporate all of that. And this is what we've been talking about since 2005. So we define adventure tourism as three key components, and that's the physical activities. So whether you're canyoneering, whether you're climbing, kayaking, uh, any of those sport activities that require involvement. Interaction with nature and the environment, that might be birding, wildlife viewing, safari. It might be deep interaction with the environment, study programs, it might be watching calving glaciers uh, on either pole, those type of activities. And then it includes the cultural component, which is an increasingly uh, a key element of the adventure tourism definition. And so that would include cultural immersion, cultural exchange. It does include some of those activities, uh, music, art, uh, community traditions, indigenous people's traditions, all of those activities that incorporate the cultural element. I will share with you a single statement that I drew out of uh, UN WTO, the World Tourism Organization, Secretary General Taleb Rifai, who said, just two weeks ago, adventure tourism is what tourism should be today and definitely what it will be tomorrow. And for anyone who will be taking notes during this session, I encourage you to write this one thing down at Google or Vimeo or YouTube. Just type in Telebrify and adventure. And there there's a definition, or I'm sorry, there's a short interview, it's three minutes long, where he describes why this will be the case. So I have a beautiful graph here. I will spare you the, uh, the PowerPoint chart. For years, going back decades, the average growth for mass tourism in general, actually it's leisure and business tourism, the growth rate is approximately 4%. Adventure tourism, which legitimately started as a commercial enterprise in approximately the 1950s, around about the time Sir Edmund Hillary summited Everest, had a Sherpa along. That's about the time when commercial enterprise began. Uh, rafters were going down the United States Grand Canyon, and out of that evolved adventure tourism in its truest sense today, the commercial sense. And so you had commercial rafters, uh, rafting companies going down the Grand Canyon at that time, and you fast forward the 1970s, and I'm gonna distill this down since we lost time. Basically, you had the tree huggers and granola eating folks who were out there doing extreme activities, but really kind of seeking life and experience. And then 1980s, you had an evolution of the concept of ecotourism, and then you moved into the next phase, uh, which in the 1990s was more activity-based. And then an awakening, cultural aspects came into the whole picture and evolved today, and then we have that definition. The growth since 2009 year to year in adventure tourism, as we define it, has grown 16 to 17% since that time. And so that growth is either new entries into the space and or what we really think is happening in migration from leisure tourism into more of the adventure-based activities. And so that growth is expected to continue at a very steep curve. Right now there's about a 26% market penetration for adventure tourism out of the entire leisure tourism pie. I'm just gonna make a couple comments about some what, what I deem notable shifts and trends in adventure tourism. Uh, right now, of course, we see the volatile economic climate worldwide. Uh, we have elections going on. Uh, very curious to see what my nation has in mind for tomorrow. That'll be very interesting. Uh, and then yet there's market resiliency for tourism. And in particular, adventure tourists who tend to jump in faster and sooner than any other sector of tourism to get back to a place after a natural disaster, conflict, or what have you. 
travelers, we, we've heard this ad nauseum. Uh, I'll say it here just for context. Uh, increasingly seeking the authentic, transformative experiences, in particular for adventure tourism. When we talk about transformative experiences, adventure tourism, by its very definition, is when we get outside of our comfort zone. And so whether that's culturally, like for most Americans, stepping outside the borders of our country, it's quite an adventure. Um, and uh, culturally, uh, environmentally, and also activity-based. So we see the rise of adventure in leisure tourism in general. You see uh, luxury tourism sector, cruise industry, sun and beach, adding on adventure tourism product, done in a day type activities. So we're seeing that activity going on and it's on a very steep rise. The traveler profiles changing. You're gonna hear a great deal from these folks. So I'll just let, let uh, the true experts on uh, identifying the, the consumer profile. Uh, the, uh, I'll let them speak to that. The one thing I will point out is in the next 20, 25 years or so, a significant, significant chunk of our market will not necessarily be traveling anymore because that boomer generation is going to be moving on. And so we have to really pay attention to that as we want to develop new and younger markets. Source markets, we all know, are significantly changing and we must pay attention to those. In particular, the brick markets, but there's also those acronyms uh, for other uh, markets that are emerging quite quickly. The most significant, if I could leave you with one thing, the biggest trend that we're seeing is an awareness of the economic impact of adventure tourism versus mainstream tourism. Mainstream tourism tends to leave, and this is by multiple research uh, sources uh, over the last few years, approximately 10 to 15 cents on every dollar in the destination. Most of that money is leaking out of the destination. And what's important for us in our future is we keep that money in the destinations. We know through empirical and anecdotal evidence, and we're gearing up to do a significant study on this in at least four destinations around the world, an economic impact study on adventure tourism, specialized tourism. Because we estimate, and so do over 200 of our operators, estimate that approximately 65, 67% of every dollar stays in that destination which is much better for the economic health of everywhere we visit, and most importantly, for the people uh, in those locations. So what's happening as a result of this awakening? Destinations, private enterprise, NGOs, are seeing this economic model. Even in the United States, you've seen a big shift in the last year where the Commerce Department's actually saying, ah, rural tourism development and tourism in general, it's bringing more dollars into our destination. So that's all of our opportunities worldwide in destinations. The only way we can do that, and this is the trend that's emerging, is true cooperation among competitors. We call that coopetition between destinations, between regions, between airlines, et cetera, to get us where we need to go. So what happens with this awakening? We, we're beginning to see a values-driven shift in how we fundamentally approach tourism, in particular for adventure tourism. It's going to be incumbent upon everybody in this room, everybody at this table, to focus on the values, the deeper values that drive responsible business. Uh, you see coffee companies worldwide saying organic, community grown, community harvested. This is in mainstream commodity products. Our industry is woefully behind. So this is our opportunity now. As we go with the development shift, all of our sites should be set on all of the appropriate CSR activities, corporate social responsibility, do the right thing, A, because it's the right thing, right, the golden rules, and B, because you can make money off of it, and our industry, adventure tourism, the traveler, they stay longer, this is soft tourism in particular, okay, the hardcore adventure tourism, a little bit less on the spend front, and, and uh, they're more budget oriented, but the core, of adventure tourism is soft adventure. That means we do activities during day, cultural immersion, engagement with the environment. But most of us uh, want a soft bed at night, we want gourmet food, we want to learn, and we want to drink wine at night as a general rule. So this is what we're talking about here. That is where our opportunity is. Many organizations today are realigning around this values-driven shift in the development shift where there's a premium on this product and everybody in this room should be 
steer very clear of discounting. They should hold premium on the value that adventure tourism brings. If you're transforming people's lives, whether it's the people you're visiting or the destinations, or you're the traveler yourself, or you're the trade, hold the price, premium. This is, this is where experience, the whole experience economy comes into play. So we can take advantage of that. On the realignment, the technology companies, uh, the uh, conservation organizations around the world are starting to realign how they approach tourism, in particular, adventure tourism, because of the power this brings. On a practical note, and then I'll wrap up here in the next four minutes, internet, mobility, storytelling. We, uh, you've probably heard dozens and dozens of presentation on this. Invest even more time and energy into understanding that. Google, Google's chief of travel, Rob Torres, just said last uh, two weeks ago at our summit, he was a keynote speaker. We did an interview with him on stage. And uh, he's talking about storytelling and visuals. That will be the way we communicate value. That will be the way we communicate travel. And they're investing heavily into it, in it. So if you have stories to tell from your destinations, your operation, be ready, invest in that. Throughout all of this, we're seeing innovation and subsector development. So within adventure tourism, you're seeing brand new sports being developed, kite surfing on ice, you know, all sorts of different cultural activities, learning environments where I can go and learn uh, how to become a milk farmer or produce Parmesan cheese or, you know, become a gourmet pizza chef, any of those activities. Significant increases in itineraries, and you're going to hear customization here shortly. Uh, in the last few years, we've seen an average of 26 itineraries offered by, this is a survey of 300 tour operators around the world. In 2007, they averaged 26 to 27 itineraries. Two years ago, they averaged about 40. That number skyrocketed to over 70 individual itineraries, and the customization's going to make that proliferate as well. We all know shrinking booking windows, the done-in-a-day movement, which we already talked about, the middleman is going to be set aside, by and large. So the larger companies are gobbling up some of the larger tour operators, but becoming bigger. And then the SMEs, the smaller organizations, which make up the lion's share of our over 500 tour operators worldwide. That is where, our, that's where a lot of the growth, innovation, and value, and premium pricing is going to be held. Specialization. And then we also know of course, that this, the commerce model is shifting about where we're sourcing that. So the social media, stand front, referrals, and reviews. I will repeat, adventure tourism is what tourism should be today and what, or definitely what tourism will be tomorrow, and that's from Telebri 5. So Thank you I will take much. this. Um, thank you, Chris, and, and manfully done without the, uh, or personfully done, I'm sure we're in an equal opportunity world. Um, uh, you're holding the price point was an interesting thing. I saw Jose Dominic, where are you, Jose? There, walking in just now. I have to say that I had the um, tourism, ex come on, come and do your plumbing. Uh, had the tourism experience of, um, of uh, my life recently when I went on a genuine holiday to uh, one of his hotels, well, actually three of his, four of his places altogether, a company called CGH Earth in um, Kerala. Um, environmental responsibility like I have never seen before, built in ab initio since they started how many years ago? Uh, John Torres, uh, 20 years ago. 20 years ago, before, before Harold Goodwin was born, almost. So before t responsible tourism started. And what Jose told me was that... Um, uh, when he first began, he started somewhere where the, pr he, he, the price point for, for the Oberoi in Delhi was $190, and he built something with a coconut roof and simple, simple rural accommodation with no phone, no internet, no anything. Well, there wasn't an internet then, and he charged $190, and everybody said, why? And he said, because it would be an excellent experience, and it was. Hold your price. So now, um, the masterful work of this team. Uh, thank you, Paul, for your, um, all of your effort to get us this far. Are we nearly there? Two seconds. Two seconds. OK, well, we'll believe him. Do you want to start whilst he does all this, or? 
Now, we're going to call now for a six foot six person. Can you do this or do you want some assistance? Okay. Uh, what they believe they've done is to load everything onto, this has been a miracle if it works, of um, all kinds of um, bits of uh, the um, internet technology age, uh, USB sticks and a donated laptop for which we are in, in forever grateful. And with a bit of luck, you may see a picture. If you don't, it doesn't matter because the three brains, the three personalities are still here and they still have their stories to tell. And the first of those, and who, what Scotsman ever needed pictures? Um, Scotsman can um, persuade anybody to do absolutely anything if they try. Paul Easto has been doing that for a number of years. Perhaps, Paul, you can start telling people about it whilst the plumbing continues. And we'll all, would you all mind crossing your fingers and, and keep them crossed? Paul, you're on. Great. Thank you, Ken. And thanks, Doyle, for that warm up there. Um, just a, a, a quick question to you. Who, who's been to Scotland before here? Okay, pretty good. Who's been more than once? Not bad. Okay, excellent. Um, so if I asked you to think of some images that are synonymous with Scotland, what, what would you come up with? Shooting. Shooting. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> okay, so uh, stags we talked about. So Tartan, Highland Games, bird watching. Okay, it's pretty interesting, you know. Um, most people would typically say, and you've know, got the images to support this, is around Tartan, uh, whiskey, golf, um, lots of golf, of course, and castles, and often them um, combined as well. And, you know, in essence, what I'm going to talk about today, just in the short time I have available, is to look at really how Scotland is a destination. This is about the destination rather than our particular business, but obviously, you know, what we do as an active and nature-based tour operator is work in Scotland and also in, in Ireland and England as well, increasingly in recent years, um, is fundamental um, in terms of what the destination has been doing. I think you're going to find a very interesting journey over the last 10 years. Um, we're still without those images. But in essence, what you found was in uh, around about 2003, Visit Scotland, which is the uh, national tourism agency responsible for marketing the destination, um, saw that in essence, Scotland was quite one dimensional, particularly with, uh, okay, we're looking good. Excellent. Great, well done, well done, excellent. So, okay, so, yep, there we go, lots of castles, uh, golf courses, and, yeah. Okay, so what we had, um, you know, it was quite interesting around 2003, uh, was a sort of realization by Visit Scotland at the time um, that Scotland was quite one-dimensional in terms of its tourism offer. And the simplest way that I would describe it is that Scotland was very much about come and see rather than come and do, with the exception of maybe some of those activities you talked about, golf and, and shooting. It was a very kind of static, passive tourism experience. And if you look at what the motivators are uh, in tourism increasingly, people are looking for, for a lot more than that. Um, so it was kind of research-led brand positioning exercise that, that Visit Scotland conducted. And I think that in itself is a very interesting point because, you know, on one hand, um, you can approach it from where there's the demand uh, exists. And on the other hand, looking on the supply side, it's all very well to say that there is more interest in adventure tourism, but is the product there? Well, in Scotland's case, the product has been there for a long time. It's just the world hasn't really known about it. Um, so the work that was done was only on the UK and Ireland segment, so that source market for Scotland, which is hugely important, um, really identified an opportunity to develop what they saw as adventure sports. And this distinction between adventure sports and adventure travel or adventure activities and adventure travel is very important. I'll come on to that. So there's some key strands that are identified in the offer. So mountain biking was one. Um, surfing was another one, uh, sea kayaking, so quite high-end, if you like, adrenaline sort of based activities. In essence, I mean, I kind of term this almost the, at this period like the birth of the kind of Red Bull generation, um, which probably culminates in jumping out of a, a capsule at 100,000 feet. I don't want to see that. It was just the most in incredible thing. Um, but really, there was a lot of interest. And at that time, what we found, particularly, uh, there was that events played such an important role in giving the destination an identity and giving it credibility, most importantly. You can say, as been termed here, Europe's adventure capital was the positioning. Um, but really, what is there to back that up? Now, as a few key things happened, um, there's a lot of investment in mountain biking uh, on the government side, working hand-in-hand in hand with the private sector. That, in turn, really sort of snowballed and led to the World Mountain Bike Championships taking place in the Scottish Highlands 
in 2007, and that was huge. Um, they, they had the World Cup there each year, and they still continue to have the World Cup. But the World Championships, you know, it's the kind of pinnacle of mountain biking, and it really put Scotland on the map. And a few years later, uh, the International Mountain Bike Association uh, named Scotland for two years in a row the number one mountain bike destination in the world. And now there's not a lot of people that possibly know that. Uh, those that have been to Scotland may have, may have ridden a bike, but many other destinations around the world um, have a reputation for great biking, but Scotland twice in a row was, was named number one. And other events, we had the kind of World Adventure Race Championships in the same year. It was also the year of the Highlands. So there was real kind of momentum around this. But my key point here is that the focus was very much on adventure sports and not adventure travel. And you know, that in itself is quite a philosophical thing. Just looking at mountain biking as an example, this is taken from a place called Glentress, which is in the Scottish borders. I remember going there um, in, when I started mountain biking, probably in the early 90s, so about 20 years ago and there were a couple of sweaty guys getting changed in the car park, and that was it. Uh, this year, there'll be about 400,000 visitors to Glentress. You know, they've now got a 10 million pound visitor center there. It's an amazing success story, and it's for everyone, families, young, old, um, novice mountain bikers, more experienced. You know, it's an incredible success story that's transformed the economy of Peebles, the, uh, the, the local town there. So, you know, is there a difference between adventure activity and sports and adventure travel? I, I say there is. Um, I say the key is really around um, whether the activity is an end in itself or rather a, a means to an end. And for us, in the, the range of trips, we only have about 80 different itineraries that we offer across the UK and Ireland. Um, we are very much positioned towards the adventure travel end. This is about the whole experience. And I've just got a couple of quick examples to demonstrate that from two different products that we have. Um, so this is a sailing and walking trip that we run around the Scottish Islands. You stay on board, 70-foot classic sailboat, uh, eight clients and three staff. Um, it's an amazing way to, to experience uh, the islands. Uh, the boat itself gets you around. It gets you some, some amazing places. This is St Kilda um, on the far, very western edge of Europe. It's a double UNESCO World Heritage Site. There's very few places in the world like that, but no one there. You only can access it by boat. So it gets you into great locations where you can go ashore and hike. The wildlife is fantastic, and the food is a really important part of this experience. Although we're on a boat, um, you know, take great pride in the food. That's, so these are langoustines that have just been landed off a local fishing boat, and an hour later, they're on the table for dinner. So you know, all elements, really, wildlife, culture, food, adventure, are wrapped up within a single experience. Another example, great photograph, I like this one, um, of a, just a cycle touring trip uh, through the Scottish Highlands. Um, you know, this is quite a sort of high-priced product, um, but it's, it's a cycle tour through great scenery, quiet roads, the things that you would associate with Scotland. But then thinking about the way in which we can, you know, really sort of mix up this experience. So this is, instead of using a very busy road alongside Loch Ness, in the morning we're using a rib boat to go up to Castle Urquhart, which you can see in the picture, which is a 13th century castle, go ashore, and then we'll rejoin the bikes and carry on on the journey. So, you know, quite a, a fun way to experience Loch Ness. And then, you know, lots of local inns and restaurants and great accommodation on the way you can call in. And I, actually, four of these five images, when I was putting this together, was taken on the same day. And I think that's one of the great strengths, particularly of the UK, is you can have such a diverse experience in, in a very short period of time. So, fast forward to 2009, um, some key success factors that really took, I think, Scotland away from necessarily adventure sports and into adventure travel. And really, what the first of that, and I, I sort of encourage any destination to do this, um, is really quantifying the value of the industry to Scottish tourism in this case, whatever that might be, and also the opportunity. Now, the work that was done unbelievably showed that adventure tourism in all its forms is worth one billion pounds to the Scottish economy, which is 25% of all tourism spend. So it's very similar to the figure that Doyle referred to there. I think it gives it some credence. And more particularly, you know, it was, a, it was a high value sector. The daily spends were way higher than we were getting from regular tourists. And the market opportunity was greater again. The 19% figure of annual growth, I think that's what we've also experienced in Scotland, um, whereas mass tourism is flatlining. So there's really great opportunities for there that apply to this particular period, but also will, will apply as we move forward. And then really thinking about how we mobilize the trade, it's great to have a, a, you know, a powerful kind of marketing organization behind you, but you would need to ensure that the private sector is there delivering on the product side. And at the, around the same time, we coalesce two organizations, one on activity, one on wildlife, 
to form one organisation called Wild Scotland that represents 140 members uh, in Scotland who deliver a range of adventure travel experiences. And then really sort of the, the, the third string in this was the Adventure Travel World Summit. I know many of you, you will, have, will have been. That was, if you like, a coming of age for Scotland, 600 uh, travel trade and media attending a week-long event uh, in the Scottish Highlands. It was a great opportunity to showcase to the world the progress that we have made and the direction we were taking. So it was a great opportunity to work with the ATTA and uh, you know, really push Scotland on. And then just to wrap, really, thinking around the uh, sort of future opportunities uh, and challenges, I, you know, absolutely be clear on this. If you're not already in this sector, understand that this is an extremely high-value sector. It is not like hair shirts and long beards, I can assure you. Um, absolutely high-value, good spend, longer visitor duration, um, and it's high growth as well. And if done properly, it is sustainable. You know, it's the ultimate sustainable form of tourism. If you can, whether it's wildlife or walking, anything that's human powered, um, you know, that's, that's a real, um, you know, great testament to the quality, I think, of this industry as, as it moves forward. A key point is really developing that understanding of what adventure tourism means. I have um, seen this in a number of destinations. I've been asked in the last few years to uh, advise a couple of de different destinations on adventure tourism strategy development uh, and it's interesting because I think there's, there's still a misunderstanding of what it actually is and it's important to think what it means for your destination. I walked in yesterday and I can't remember the destination but there were like two or three images out of four, I think it was Abu Dhabi actually, two or three images out of four that were promoting adventure tourism um, and it was interesting to see it's not just the case of producing imagery, it's thinking about actually what um, infrastructures you have on the ground and where does your position fit within that wider kind of global market? Because the, the, the market for adventure absolutely is global. And this related to this point is ensuring you can deliver on the brand promise. What I have seen in lots of destinations is a strong interest in developing in this sector, but they're not really having the product to back it up. So some fantastically creative and innovative and award-winning marketing campaigns, but when the customer gets on the ground, they're disappointed because the reality um, is not what's being presented. Um, so, you know, it's a really important aspect of it. The adventure tourism industry is hugely fragmented, even by, you know, tourism standards. There are thousands of operators, many of them one or two, two person operators, but they're all delivering great products. You need to think about a way in, in bringing those together. And then and just finally, I've just talked about this, just really thinking about what your position is. I think for Scotland, we talk a lot about accessible adventure because you can have a, a wide range of adventures in a very um, small area. And that's one of our great strengths. And you know, we continue to play to that, whether that's in the UK or beyond. For us in Scotland, I think the biggest challenge we have now is actually getting a much clearer understanding in international markets as to what Scotland means in terms of adventure for a North American tourist or a German or a French or an Australian or even emerging markets, Brazilian. They still see Scotland, as I go back to, as golf, uh, castles and tartans. So for us, I guess that's our, our main next challenge is really developing Scotland's position in, in a global market. So thanks very much. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'm reminded, incidentally, the story about you know the images on Abu Dhabi or wherever it was being activity tourism. Some years ago, I was asked by the Irish government or, or the tourist board to look at why golf numbers to Ireland were dwindling um, for their very fine golf courses, for, particularly from the American market. And the answer was that they, they were being sold as golf courses. Uh, you know, Jack Nicklaus designed it. It's the finest in the world. But why golfers chose to go there rather than the Algarve or Mexico or wherever was because of Irishness. And I think this is the point about activity holidays. Wherever you do them, people want the flavor of the nation, the character of the nation, the food of the nation to shine through. Our next speaker, Catherine Crone, Managing Director of Headwater Holidays, um, a very fine company with a big range of product. And uh, here she's going to tell us what has happened since it was born and how it's gone through all these years of development to where it is today. Catherine. We'll and get a, there. a big thanks to Paul for the replumbing of all of this. Um, assuming, I, I'm saying that now before he does it, of course, but uh, there we are. And then to turn it, just press that one. Once again, your applause for Paul. Thank not you, only, Paul. Not only will there be Scotland, but I'm the IP department. <laughs>
Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Catherine Crone. I'm the managing director at Headwater. We started the business 27 years ago, and I've been there for the last 23 years. So I've been asked this afternoon just to look back over those 23 years and to give you a bit of a heads up on how I think customer interests and expectations have changed over those past 23 or so years. Okay. So, in many ways, the core Headwater customer hasn't changed since we started back in 1985. The market that we appeal to is empty nester couples aged 50 years and over. In the, on the whole, they tend to be well-heeled, reasonably well-traveled, a high percentage of retired professionals with legal, medical, education backgrounds being predominant. They want to be active by day, but they want creature comforts in the evening. They prefer off-the-beaten-track destinations to tourist hotspots. So that's what they're the sort of people we were appealing to 27 years back. They're still the people that we're appealing to today. So what has changed? Firstly, the way that customers choose their holiday. In 1985, virtually all new inquiries that we got in were generated by newspaper advertising. 100% of our marketing budget was spent on traditional print and paper, which after this afternoon is probably not a bad start. 100% um, of customers bought the holiday package as advertised in our brochure. So if we promoted it, they bought it exactly as we, as we packaged it and sold it. 100% of customers flew on the flight we promoted or traveled by ferry if they were going to Europe on the ferry that we suggested. And any questions that the customers had were answered by our sales team. There, was, there wasn't really anybody else to go to. We were the sole authority. So in a nutshell, we were in control. Moving on to the millennium in 2000, and still 95% of new inquiries were generated by newspaper advertising and PR. 95% of our budget was still being spent on print and paper, and 80% of customers bought the holiday package that we advertised. But things were starting to change, and 20% of customers around the millennium changed the package. They either added extra nights, or they chose, they wanted to fly on a flight that maybe we didn't advertise as our standard one. Low-cost airlines started to impact customer choices. EasyJet was started in 2000, and people were starting to think, hmm, what's, what are these low-cost carriers? They're going from you know, the bottom of my back garden sort of thing, so I prefer to fly with them than travel to an airport a while away. Um, any questions were still answered, though, in the main by our sales team. Our voice was still the most credible, and we were still very much in control. Then we get to 2012, and a lot's changed in those 12 years. 98% of our new inquiries are now generated by online activity. 35% of our marketing spend is now given over to online activity, and this percentage is growing at a pretty high rate year on year. 87% of customers do not buy the holiday that we advertise in the brochure, which means that virtually every holiday we sell to some degree is tailor-made to suit them. Low-cost flights are now not seen as cheap and cheerful particularly. They're part of the package. And wherever possible, customers want to fly from their local airport. The, the credence of flying on the BA, the national airline, or whoever, it isn't there anymore. They want convenience, and they want the price to be right, but convenience is the key. Choice flexibility is key. Customers, before they come to us, whilst they're with us and after they've traveled with us, use travel forums, social media, blogs, websites such as TripAdvisor to gain opinions from other travelers. No longer is our word the only relevant reference. They've got much more, they'd much rather hear it from the real people rather than people they feel maybe are trying to sell them something. So now it's the customer who's very much in control. If we move on to how customers book and pay for their holiday, we see similar changes. In 1985, 70% of the bookings came in via the telephone, and the remaining 30% arrived in envelopes through the post. Everybody who travelled with us was required to complete a printed booking form, and everybody bought the travel insurance through us. And typically, people, we, we tend to specialise in European travel. We do a bit outside of Europe, but the majority of, travel, of holidays that we sell tend to be within Europe. And people, traditionally, historically, were booking six to eight months before departure. And once they paid for the holiday, we posted the receipt and we promised they'd get that within seven days. We relied totally on paper and phones. By 2000, 70% of bookings had come in via the phone, 
20% came in via fax, for people who remember those, and 10% via email. So we had got email in the millennium, but it wasn't widely, widely used. Booking forms, printed booking forms were still the norm. 80% um, of people bought in our travel insurance. So people had started to look around and maybe they had annual policies on the home insurance or the banks had started to offer travel insurance as well. People were booking slightly later. So four to six months was the average book, uh, book time before departure date for European holidays. 80% of customers paid by check. So we still got the post in the envelopes in the morning and 20% had started to pay on a credit card. Everybody got a posted receipt still within seven days. So again, even in the millennium, uh, paper and phones were key. Where are we today? 50% of our bookings come in via the telephone. So still quite a high percentage showing that people do want to talk to a real person when it's maybe a non-standard holiday or a non-typical package holiday. So 50% of bookings come in via the telephone, 30% via web, and 20% via email. We don't have booking forms any longer. Less than 15% of customers buy our travel insurance. Over 50%, over half the people who travel with us to Europe book within three months of departure. 90% pay by credit card or debit card and 10% via backs transfer. I can't remember the last time I saw a check in the office. We don't send receipts by post. We don't send invoices by post. Everything's emailed and we guarantee we do that within two hours. So most of our communication is done online. Thirdly, what do they expect or look for when they actually travel with us? Okay, looking back to 1985, what did people want? Well, they wanted good, clean, two-star level accommodation was fine. They wanted honest descriptions. They wanted it to be sold as seen. Um, they didn't want anything too posh. We were dealing with walkers and cyclists, and they did want a private loo, but they didn't want to turn up in muddy, muddy walking boots and feel out of place. They were traveling to places off the beaten tracks, so they wanted the owner eccentricities. They, they quite liked those. If something went a bit wrong, it was a story to come home and tell. And good home country cooking, fixed menu, pichet of local wine, ticked all the boxes. The activity, we've always since day one graded the activity in terms of activity level, so people know what to expect and whether or not they're up to that, you know, whether they want easy through to challenging and everything in between. We sent out written maps, sorry, we sent out maps and written route notes so they didn't need to worry about getting lost and they wanted the off-the-beaten-track destinations so they could go home and brag to the neighbours over the garden fence that they'd been to somewhere that they probably hadn't heard of. And on the ground, they wanted local transfers. We had to pick them up from wherever they arrived. They needed some sort of support if there was an emergency. That's why they went with the tour operator. And on touring holidays from hotel to hotel, if they were walking or cycling, we always moved their bags for them. By the millennium, we were starting to see a real change in what people were wanting hotel-wise. Um, Two-star top end of the range was still okay, but three-star was really what people had started to look for in this age bracket. And ensuite was pretty much, if we weren't offering ensuite rooms, we didn't really sell many of them. Um, they still wanted character, characterful owner-managed hotels, but they did want the professional touches in the areas they thought were important. And they wanted a choice for evening meals, as some of the other people have said this afternoon. Food, wine was starting to become more and more important. So they didn't really just want the local plonk, you know, piche put down in front of them. They did want a choice of wines. But they wanted local wines that they could, you know, feel part of the region. Again, we, we continued to grade the activities by activity level. We gave written maps, written route notes and maps, and they went off the beaten track destinations. Not a lot of change there. And the only change really on the ground was they did want 24-hour support. But by 2012, what, were pe what do people now want? Three and four star hotels are pretty much the norm for us. If they've got swimming pools, fitness equipment, gyms, spas, landscape gardens, they'll sell first. They still want owner managed. They don't want chain hotels. They want, they want to feel that they're doing something different, exclusive, etc. But although they're owner managed, they do want competent staff who know what they're doing. Things such as fluffy towels, decent hair dryers, eco-friendly toiletries, free Wi-Fi, they're things that we get asked for every day, and if we don't provide them, people don't come home happy. And they want a la carte dining, they want an extensive wine list, damask tablecloths, and healthy and organic, organic choices, vegetarian requests catered for, um, gone are the days in France where you can put down an omelette and say, well, it's only got ham in it, so it's for vegetarians, it's fine. It's not. Um, in terms of activity, it's information that's key. 
So, yes, they're still graded by the old style activity level, but they want full details now. People ask us about the terrain, they ask us for altitudes, they ask us if vertigo, uh, what percentage of the day they'll be walking in the sun or the shade. All these things are questions that in 1985 we'd never have got asked. We now get asked these things on a daily basis. We still provide maps and written route notes, but now we get GPS coordinates are given as well, and we're working on getting route notes which are compatible with mobile. <coughs> No longer is it just a case of where we can link nice hotels. We used to probably get away in the early years with being able to just link nice hotels with nice, pleasant walking. And providing we gave decent route notes, people were not unhappy with that. Now they want interest-packed route notes. So we can't just link nice hotels. There's got to be a lot to see and do on the way, and it's got to be interesting. <laughs> Support, they know we get more and more questions for private transfers. They don't want to go in a group or on a minibus. Um, they want English-speaking support. They, you know, the idea of uh, ha having to get by in a foreign language, they'll do it. But if there's a problem, they want somebody who speaks English there 24 hours. We now have a 24-hour UK duty office in case there's a serious problem. And as well as looking after our bikes, checking route notes, moving luggage, our guides do need to be bilingual and expert in their field. So what have been the top 10 changes that I've observed? Firstly, the web is king and flexibility is key. Customers do their research online, and they then decide which operators or agents they're going to shortlist. They love the web for research and convenience, but they still do want the human touch. And I'm not somebody who is an advocate of dead is the brochure, or there won't be any travel brochures in five years' time. I still think there is a very much a place for printed brochures, and people want to touch, hold, and feel something that's visually attractive. Online reviews have certainly replaced word of mouth recommendations. And customers expect you to fit in with their diaries and requirements, not the other way around. Basic clean accommodation is no longer good enough. Even the most hardy adventure traveler wants a high level of creature comforts in the night, sorry, in the evening, and no compromises will be tolerated. Sustainable tr travel has become very, very important to a high percentage of travelers with us. They want to travel responsibly, and they're very much more environmentally aware than they were 20 or so years back. The more customers travel, the more confident they get, and by default, the higher their demands and expectations. They know what good, good looks like, but they are prepared to pay for it. So again, it's not, you know, I'm totally of the view that you can carry on having premium priced product because people will pay for it, but they want value, they still want value in what they pay for. The more people travel, the more knowledge they gain, and knowledge breeds a thirst for more knowledge. And they want that beneath the skin experience, and they want to come home having learned something that they wouldn't find in a guidebook. And they don't expect the service to stop just because their holiday has. And I think the opportunities for good post-sales service are very high. They've never been as strong. So for the future, crystal ball time. I would say dynamic packaging, making your own package up and having the components that you want, not that the operator wants, will be the norm. Companies without a full hello, we know you, in fully integrated IT system won't survive. If people have to tell you every year that they're vegetarians or give you your passport number every year or give you their address or whatever it is every year, they don't like it. They want to pick up the phone, say who they are, and they expect you. If they've told you once, they expect you to know that. Global mass communications won't be tolerated for much longer. I don't think they are now, really. You know, if, somebody, if you know that you've got somebody who always travels to Italy with you, why on earth are you emailing them about Germany? You, know, you should be emailing them or sending to them what the communication that they want to hear. All information is going to have to be designed to be mobile, and I think we're almost there now. And although some people will always want new activities and new destinations, there still will be place for the tried and tested. We only have to look at what GB team, Team GB has done for the cycling this summer. You know, cycling's been around for, for years and years, yet suddenly it's taken off with the Olympics and Wiggins and the Tour de France, etc. But it will have to be presented in new innovative ways. Customers will become increasingly confident travel, travelers, and I feel that the biggest threat for tour operators, travel providers, is DIY, do it yourself. They've got the t if they've got the time, they're now getting increasingly knowledgeable, more and more confident DIY is the main threat. So staff training and knowledge will be critical because the only reason to go with a tour operator is if that operator knows more than they know themselves or more than they can gain by looking online. So what's the key? I believe it's service, service, and service again. Thank you.
Wow, what a, what a catalogue of um, changed behaviour, changed technology and um, change in what is successful. As Ashley. Um, Ashley Toft is next, uh, Managing Director of Explore. Um, this session will, we have to be out by I think about 3.15, so you can be sure we will be, but we've got plenty of time if we do that, and time for a few questions. So Ashley, over to you. Once again, our thanks to Paul. Who is the person whose um, laptop we borrowed? Um, I owe you a bottle of champagne, okay? Please, um, not for any other reason, I will tell my wife I've got it, but will you give me your number afterwards? And um, I shall see you get it, thank you very much. Ashley. Good afternoon. I'm one of those uh, sweaty guys in a Scottish car park that Paul was talking about earlier, having um, mountain bikes off-road to John O'Groats earlier this year. That's not the reason I'm here to talk to you. Um, the reason I'm here to talk to you is to tell you a little bit about Explore um, and our perception of the market and I'm doing the crystal ball gazing bit which is all about what might happen with product development in the future. I've just thrown this slide up very quickly just to for those of you that don't know Explore. Um, we've been around for, for over 30 years now. We've always been very much around small group adventures um, and that includes cultural, wildlife, wilderness, walking, trekking, cycling. In the last few years, we've gone into much more tailor-made FIT adventures, and that's a big growth area for us. Um, we've launched a, a youth brand to go into the, the youth market. We, tr we carry around about 30,000 people a year, um, and at the, at the moment, a majority are still UK direct, although the, our, our sort of global sales are growing. Um, and just over a year ago, we, we became part of the Cox and Kings group. So giving you a perspective of the market very much from a, I guess, mostly from a UK perspective, but hopefully putting a bit of a, a global slant on it as well. Here are a few thoughts on um, some of the trends that we're very aware of things that I think are very relevant going forward, and it, it does dictate how we speak to our customers, who we speak to, and the way that we communicate with them. So I think it's generally known there are more active adults, but what we're seeing is, is the over 55s, the over 60s, are becoming more active more quickly. And that's a very important trend for us as a business. Singles. Um, there are more singles travelling on group activity holidays than there are couples or small groups. Um, single person households in the UK are growing 24% in the 10 years to 2015. So it's quite a sizeable trend and it's something I think we need to be aware of um, as we think about who we're talking to and how we're talking to them. There is a trend towards more couples doing separate trips. So uh, Mr. Smith wants to go off and climb Kilimanjaro. Mrs. Smith doesn't. Um, so very often they will go off and do separate trips or he will go off with friends. And again, that's something just to think about that certainly wasn't a, a key factor a few years ago. There are more men than women doing uh, active adventures, but that gap is closing. And actually, the women, the, the female side of the market is, is growing much more quickly than the male side at the moment. Although there is another side to that, which is to some of the more specific adventurous destinations that, that we operate to, some of the 140 countries, um, we do have a lot more females travelling with us for security, safety reasons. Um, the 20s to 30s age group, it's much more about social travel. They love to travel in, in multinational groups. It's as much about the group experience as it is about the travel destination. Very much value-led, um, something we debate an awful lot in the office is uh, why are we going into this market when they're all becoming students and none of them can afford to travel now, spending nine, ten thousand pounds a year on fees. Well, maybe it's true that, that a lot of those in the UK won't go to university and they will be out earning and travelling. So that market is changing lots of different factors to consider. Families are becoming more adventurous. Um, parents not wanting their kids stopping them 
going off to travel around the world, grown-up backpackers. A real trend towards uh, families with teenagers, actually, having that one last adventure, that big family holiday, before the kids fly the nest. Little do they know. Um, life through the screen, I think, has to be up there. I'll come back to this in a minute. Um, but it has huge opportunities for all of us in the adventure travel business uh, and a lot of challenges as well. I think um, the perception is a very important thing to talk about as well. Um, everyone has much more access to adventurous travel on the TV, online. Um, there is a perception still that adventure travel is just for the young. A uh, very strong perception, actually. And I think something that Chris mentioned earlier, it's, it's everyone has a different view of what adventure and adventurous means. And one of our big challenges is catering to all those different views, um, all those different as aspirations and expectations. I'm going to skim through this because I'm pretty much um, echoing what... What Catherine said just now, I think seamless service is an absolute given. Without it, we're completely dead in the water. Instant response, people want an answer now. They expect that. If you don't do it, you're in trouble. Technology, absolutely, we have to embrace, keep up with, in, with technology. In a world of telepresence, robots and 3D printing, um, it's very easy to fall behind and it can be quite a challenge. And indeed, for many companies, and I do I include Explore here, um, there's a catch-up. We're, we're a pretty well-established company with our own processes and IT systems, and we absolutely have to get on top of it um, in order to succeed and move forward. And a, a key part of that is all around customer reviews and capturing the stories of the people that have travelled with us, done great adventure travel, sharing those stories and facilitating that, helping people share those stories. Um, I think visualisation going forward will be incredibly important. Video, virtual tours, Google Maps, Google, Google Street View. Um, people have a thirst for really understanding, seeing, almost experiencing that experience before they go on and do it themselves. Greater Choice um, runs through everything in terms of the product, the dates, the extensions, the flights that you can offer. Um, and absolutely, it needs to be more of a personalised experience at every level, right through the booking process, um, but all the way through the, the, the travel experience as well and when they get home from that experience. Example of that is that our tailor-made travel is growing very quickly. People do want something quite bespoke, quite different. They still want it to be adventurous. They want it to be active. We only launched into Burma just over a year ago now. We haven't just got one tour in Burma. We've got seven. Um, most of them we're filling as well because people want, a lot of people want something quite different, whether it be walking, trekking, cycling, a cultural type tour, more of an interactive cultural tour. So uh, it's not enough now just to say, hey, we've got a tour in a country. You need to really think about providing that choice. More authentic, it's a phrase that's thrown away quite easily. Um, what does it mean? I think two-way interaction is really important. Get really getting under the skin of an area or a country, but making sure that it's very much a two-way cultural exchange. Um, everything we do has to be sustainable. That's at the heart of everything we do at Explore, and I think it's at the heart of of, of most of the companies in this space, actually. Um, whether it's a key decision-making factor right now is another question. Do our customers book with us, with, with other people in the market, because we're sustainable, res we're responsible in the way that we operate the tours? I can't answer that one, but what I do know is that in five, two years or five years or maybe ten years, absolutely it will be a decision-making factor. Uh, flexibility and certainty, I think um, Catherine covered quite eloquently. For, for us as a, a tour, group tour operator, there's a lot around guaranteeing departures under certainty. People, when they book a holiday, don't expect it ever to be cancelled. We have to guarantee departures. Um, once they've booked, no surcharges. They want financial security as well. I think all those things are a given. Okay, moving forward... Um, 
I think that certainly for us, for the market, there's going to be a real focus on active adventures. Certainly the whole cycling things um, side of things for us is a real focus. Um, we have 57% growth over the last 12 months in cycling adventures. Um, we saw over 100% growth during July and August when the Olympics, the Tour de France were on. Um, there are record bike sales, Wiggle, um, Chain Reaction, all of those companies had huge growth in bike sales just over the last year to 18 months. And I, I for one, absolutely believe that that trend is going to continue. Um, walking, trekking, again, if we're going to develop the product and do more specialist stuff, we have to be the experts. We have to be the specialists. And I think that's a real key thing. It goes for the cycling as well. If we're going to move into more um, road biking or more extreme mountain biking, it's not good enough just to put itineraries in, brochure on your website and sell them. We have to be the experts and we have to become known as the experts and the specialists. That links quite nicely with, with a more specialised or niche um, product. And I think that the, the more that the market progresses, we're gonna, there's going to be more specialisation. Astronomy tours, food-based tours, music, photography, um, pioneering one-off trips that are really different, maybe unique trips, things that no one else is offering. And no one else, none of them, going back to the discussion over the garden fence, something that's really unusual, really special. I missed out more adventurous. I'm running ahead of my si my, myself. Um, but I think as an adventure tour operator, we do need to push the boundaries in terms of our product offering. It's not always easy to find new destinations these days. But for us, it's all about uh, getting in there quickly, doing it properly, um, and getting it to market quickly. So examples of areas where we've gone back into recently, Congo, El Salvador, Angola, have been huge success. And it's because we've absolutely got in there quickly. We felt that we can run tours in there successfully in a good way, uh, where it's a force for good, very often in areas that have been war zones. Um, and where will be next? Will it be back into Libya? I suspect it'd be Afghanistan before Pakistan. Um, the list goes on. Um, we've had a lot of success with named experts, specialists, celebrities, and I'm sure that will be a trend that continues, something that really grabs the imagination of, of customers, people in the marketplace. Um, absolutely value-led, and actually this works quite well with um, sort of sustainable tourism in many ways. It's getting back to basics. It's almost getting back to that backpacker kind of travel um, that was so appealing 10, 20 years ago. And uh, it's not around discounting. It's about taking many of the frills out, leaving a lot of flexibility within the itinerary. And that's something certainly um, that I think we'll, we'll, we'll see grow over the coming years. Outcome-based travel, really important. I mentioned Kilimanjaro already, so there are physical outcome-based trips where a lot of guys like to really have always dreamt of getting to the top of Kili. There are much easier ones. You can cycle coast to coast here in the UK. They're journeys. There's an outcome at the end of it. And this is a trend I think that we'll see um, go on and develop. It can be a learning experience. Learn to cook, learn to surf, come away with a qualification. Um, and then I've put in here interactive, which I'll skip over, but isolation and escape. In the world of screens that we live in, I think there will be an element of escapism in future. And a lot of companies, ourselves included, are running wilderness experiences. And I think they'll become more and more um, popular as time goes on, just literally as a point to escape. A lot of what I've talked about is, is very labour intensive, actually. It's actually much easier to run big groups on a standard itinerary, um, but it's adding real value. It's giving a much more personalised, special, authentic experience. And that's what I believe is the, the future of adventure travel. Ashley, could you do these as one-liners, do you think? I could. Running out of time. Right. Um, solos, families, youth, tailor-made, value-led. <laughs> give, give them a gem.
Okay, I'll tell you what, I'll give you a, a gem with... I'm going to skip over that one and come to the last slide. I think I've covered everything on that last slide. Um, lots to think about in terms of how products will develop. As a, as a business, our product strategy will change, it will evolve, um, but actually our values and our company purpose will not. And I thought I'd just throw this up at the, at the very end. Enriching lives through adventure travel seems to link in really closely with what Chris, what Atta were talking about. And that applies not only to our customers, but to our suppliers, our tour leaders, the local communities through which we travel, and also the team, the, the Explore team. I'd like to think it's true. If it's not, absolutely, it's an aspiration. It's something we're working towards. Thank you. Well, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm old and wizened in the world of tourism. I thought that was absolutely stuffed full of um, gems, uh, all of those presentations. Uh, there's an awful lot in there to get your teeth into. Um, sitting in the back row, by the way, is a representative of our sponsor for this session, Eurosport. I'd like to thank them for sponsoring this and the other sports sessions. Thank you for that. Um, and we now do have, until somebody comes in that door and says, you've got to leave, we have time for questions. But as I know when I say that, some of you will get up and go. I would like you, before you do that, to thank every member of this team who have put a lot of effort into giving you the facts that they have, and also that monumental effort of Paul and Chris and others in getting everything onto the, onto the laptop so you could see it all. So please thank them all. Chris Doyle, Paul Easto, Catherine Cohn, and Ashley Toff. Do we have any burning questions? Yes, please, sir. Question for Ashley. How do you go about choosing your destination? How do you choose your destinations is the question. Uh, they should be working. Yes, the microphone working over there? Are these working? Yes, yeah. they are. Can you hear? How do we choose destinations? Well, um, I think five, ten years ago, the way our business was developing and the market was developing, it was around finding new countries, uh, new areas to visit. I think now it's much more around different ways of visiting those countries. It's much more around the experience and the experience. The, the customer experience is at the heart of everything. Um, and in terms of the strategy, I've covered a lot of, of our strategy, how we're going to develop our products in the future. And um, one, one of the problems we do have very often is there's almost too much product out there. And I know on one of my slides I had choice, but, but what the other challenge for us as a business, and I'm sure for all of us, is how do you filter that choice? And I think something that we have to do for our customers is help them and facilitate that, help them filter the huge choice that's out there. We have, well, in the old days, it would have been filing cabinets full of fantastic itineraries, fantastic ideas, um, but it has to fit our ethos, and, and actually we can't have too much of it. We, we can, you know, there's a, you set your stall out, and the stall can't be too huge, otherwise it's impossible for customers to choose, so. That, that's a key issue, isn't it, customers choosing, because if you're a real expert at some kind of activity, then you can do it anyway. You'll find your way to the product. But if you're, an, as it were, a general member of the public who is now deciding to move into this kind of tourism, you really do need to work it out. Can I do it or can't I? It, it, will my wife be able to walk that far? Sorry, it could be husband, equally the same. I mean, you, you have grading systems, don't you, in terms of both of yours, uh, Headwater, and um, also um, uh, you do, Ashley. So it's very easy for the customer there. What do you think, Paul? Is this some, do you grade them in Scotland? Yeah, we do. And one thing that we're working on at the moment, which will be live for next year, is actually video grading. So people can actually see exactly what a trail looks like, whether it's on a bike or on, on foot or on, in a kayak. And I just think... What we found is you can grade to your um, to the ends of the earth, but I tell you, people don't read it, you know. So, um, or they've got a somewhat selective mem uh, memory when it comes to assessing their own ability. So, put them a video in front of them, and I think it's probably the most powerful way you can communicate what's involved. But I think also the um, I can't remember how exactly how it works, but there's a sort of a one or two bicycles, or three bicycles, or four bicycles, or five bicycles, and I think that works in the sense that you know you don't look at a four bicycle. Um, trip if in fact you're a two bicycle person I mean, that, 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 that bit works so you, after that you better take your videos from the, the steepest hill otherwise people won't want to know. Another question yes please um, first of all, have you prepared research okay. for 20 people like 20 men biking and performing challenges for yeah 20 men to 400,000 how did you do it? Yeah 
does the sustainability come under threat? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I think we've, uh, it's probably one of the biggest challenges of the adventure tourism as a whole is just the carrying capacity of destinations or particular areas for certain activities. I mean, that, that um, particular example is in a purpose-built facility. So these are trails that are built, uh, you know, specifically for mountain bikes. But there's still an issue of, you know, path maintenance there and not just the environmental challenge of that, but the financial sustainability of ensuring that enough revenue can be generated. We've got a pretty odd system in Scotland is that we can't charge for access. So at the moment, that has to be publicly funded, that maintenance. Um, so all the environmental impacts are pretty well controlled because it's within a very defined area. But it raises, a, I think, a really important point around this industry as a whole. I think we all need, if we are operators, we need to be exemplars to show people um, how these things should be done. And then we'll all be like Ash Ashley's organising all these trips to the wilderness. We'll all get there at the same time with different labels on our baggage and the wilderness won't be the wilderness anymore. A few thoughts for you. Um, uh, are conventional tourism and adventure tourism converging? I mean, how do you sell an ordinary product? The answer is you find activities, adventures to tempt people. Uh, I think we're dragging the rest of the industry up rather than it coming down. Um, I quite like the, um, the value-led issue that you put up because the question is, if on the one hand we're talking about maintaining price and at the same time we're talking about value-led, how does that work? Um, and um, uh, also the issue about um, the, the, the perception is that, that adventure tourism is still for the young when the big market with lots of money is the ageing and the old, like myself who will be doing adventure travel for many more years. Hopefully with all of you, thank you so much for this afternoon. Thank you, audience. It would help as we've gone on too long. We do have to vacate the room quickly, but in doing so, once again, thanks to everybody, including the supplier of the laptop. <laughs>